Ladies and gentlemen, colleagues all, members, welcome to the National Press Club. My name is Jeff Ballou. I'm the 110th president of this historic private club with the trademark phrase, the world's leading professional organization for journalists. And where we'd like to say, given the current time in press freedom, we are the Constitution. Please submit questions via the cards on your table if you haven't already. And you can also, those of you who are viewing, you can also submit them via Twitter at Press Club DC, hashtag NPC Live, hashtag Headliners. And those of you in the house, once again, for those of you who came a little late, now's a good time to silence your cell phones and other devices that make noise. We do welcome you to tweet and follow the action and send questions in here to the club. Some upcoming events, Chicago Mayor and former Clinton senior official Rahm Emanuel will be here on June 20th for a headliners luncheon. Uh, a headliner newsmaker with the uh, former Obama Energy Secretary, Ernest Moniz, will be uh, on June 21st. Another headline newsmaker the same day at 11 a.m. with Greek Minister of Economy, Dimitri Habedimitriou. Uh, my good colleague, Peter Baker, will be here on June 29th on his latest book, Obama and the Call of History, and following in the theme of today's luncheon, General Mark Milley, the Chief of Staff of the U.S. Army, will be here on July 27th. For information on these and other events, you can log on to www.press.org. That's www.press.org. And now is the time to introduce the head table. Going to my, my far left, your right, Heather Forsgren Weaver, freelance journalist and a member of the National Pre Cl Press Club Headliners Committee uh, team, rather, that organized today's luncheon. Max Letterer, publisher of Stars and Stripes. Pat Host with Jane's Defense and current member of the National Press Club Board of Governors. Tony Capaccio, member of the National Press Club and defense reporter for Bloomberg News. Colonel Abigail Linigan, Lin, excuse me, Linnington, director of the Chairman's Action Group. Member Amanda Macias, national security reporter for CBS Radio. Captain Gregory Hicks, special advisor to the Chairman for Public Affairs. Sk skipping over myself for a moment. Elizabeth Boomeler, Washington Bureau Chief of the New York Times a member of the National Press Club, skipping over the chairman briefly. <clears throat> Excuse me. Kevin Wensing, Captain, United States Navy, retired, and the National Press Club headliners member who coordinated today's luncheon. Thank you, Kevin. John Sergeant Shaft Fails, United States Marine Corps, Vietnam veteran and president of the Blinded American Veterans Foundation. Thank you for your service, sir. Ken DeLecky, U.S. Viet Navy Vietnam veteran and senior vice commander of the D.C. Department of the American Legion, American Legion Post 20, which meets here at the National Press Club, if you didn't know that already. Thank you very much, sir, and also chair of our fellowship team who takes care of our wonderful members who are sick and distressed. Steve Sammy, publisher of Military and Diplomats World News. And I think I skipped over Don, John Donnelly. I can't skip over John. John is many things to us. John is the president of the Military Reporters and Editors Association, chair of the National Press Club Freedom Team, a past member of the National Press Club Board of Governors, and one of the ardent fighters for press freedom in the club. Thank you for your service to the club, John. And now the good part. As the tensions uh, between the U.S. And, and Russia seem to, and Syria all at the same time seem to be heating up over the shooting down of a Syrian jet over the weekend and Congress debating just how much money the U.S. military should get this go around, enter the, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Joseph F. Dunford, Jr., who is the 19th person to occupy this post, the nation's highest ranking military officer and principal military officer to the president, the Secretary of Defense, in the National Security Council. And pri prior to becoming chairman October 1st of 2015, 
General Dunford served as the 36th Commandant of the Marine Corps. He previously served as the Assistant Commandant of the Marine Corps from 2010 to 2012 and was Commander International Security Assistance Force, known as ISAF, and the United States Forces Afghanistan from February 2013 to August 2014. That'll come in handy in the questions, sir. A native of Boston, Massachusetts, General Dunford graduated from St. Michael's College and was commissioned in 1977. He served as an infantry officer in all levels to, to include the command of the 2nd Battalion, 6th Marines, and command of the 5th Marine Regiment during Operation Iraqi Freedom. There are many, many more accolades, but since time is of the essence, I'm going to, we're going to get right to the, uh, the Q&A. How we're going to do this is the General and I are going to go up on the stage here. We're going to conduct a conversation, fireside chat style. We have a lovely stack of questions here, and some have even come in through the internet, and the President's office now has an iPad. So, we, so many of you have taken advantage of that, and we'll be following along and hopefully keep up with current doings. We do have a special request uh, of, of, the, of, the, uh, of the chairman and I, and I think we can accommodate that, and that is to have a moment of silence for those who were lost and injured on the USS Fitzgerald. Thank you. No further ado, uh, General, let's go up, go up on the uh, stage and you can have some opening remarks and we'll take some questions. Mr. Chairman, the floor is yours. Okay, hey, Jeff, thanks. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, thanks very much. It, it is good to join you here today, and, and I appreciate the flexibility of the club and rescheduling. I, I canceled at the last minute in April, which I typically don't have to do, but, but as you can understand, sometimes that's required and, and, had, and, and had to do that. Uh, I'm actually glad that it was a relatively slow uh, news weekend, so I come in on a Monday. It is probably... There's probably not many questions and not much you're interested in, and there's certainly nothing controversial that I could address today. So, I, 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 you know, I, 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 feel, I feel very comfortable. So, uh, we, so with that, Jeff, I, I'll turn it over to you. Oh, well, uh, take us. Let's just okay. We'll just go right into the questions. We thought we were going to have a few extra minutes, but fine. Um, well, well we I, I can actually no. Speak for 50 of you. <laughs> I'm, I'm happy to do that. <laughs> I didn't think you were looking for a filibuster. No, but no, no, not at all. Um, <laughs> clear, <laughs> clearly, we had, uh, just to jump right into it, we just had a, a, an very tense uh, shoot down of a Syrian jet, uh, U.S. forces, uh, and we had a very ominous statement from, from Russia uh, that, that plays into the whole deconfliction uh, agreement between the countries, essentially saying anything west of the Euphrates, we're shooting down. Uh, what's your reaction to that? Uh, are there any developments? Uh, do you have any updates on where that stands? Or is, is deconfliction gone? I mean, is, what, what's, what's the latest, sir? First of all, we, we've worked very hard on deconfliction, and it's important to point out why. For the last eight months, uh, we worked on deconfliction uh, with the Russian Federation and pro-regime forces through the Russians. The purpose was to make sure that our air crews were safe, to make sure our personnel on the ground were safe, and to make sure we could prosecute the uh, defeat ISIS campaign in Syria, which is the reason why we're in Syria. Uh, that has worked very well over the past eight months, and uh, we have worked through a number of issues uh, with the Russian Federation. We have an effective link between our operation, our air operations center in Qatar 
and the uh, Russian Federation on the ground in Syria. That link is, is still uh, uh, ongoing here this morning. As when I left the building this morning, we've still been communicating over the last few hours. Uh, I, like you, saw in the open source uh, some reporting from Moscow, which I, I won't address right now. I would just tell you that we'll work diplomatically and militarily in the coming hours uh, to reestablish deconfliction. The Russian Federation has indicated that their purpose in Syria like ours, is, uh, is to defeat ISIS, and we'll see if that's true here in the coming hours because all of our operations in and around Raqqa and southern Syria are designed specifically to get after ISIS, and, and uh, we have agreed in the past, that is, we in the, in the Russian Federation and pro-regime forces, that uh, operations that the coalition was conducting in Syria were effectively uh, degrading ISIS's capability, and uh, we'll work to restore that deconfliction uh, chain in the next few hours. So are you, are you confident that U.S. forces won't be shot down? I'm confident that, uh, that we are still communicating between our operations center and the Russian Federation operations center, and I'm also confident that our forces have the capability to take care of themselves. Okay, because some people have been writing in some of those early questions, I mean, did Russia effectively declare World War III? I mean, I mean it's not that bad, but... Yeah, I, honestly, Jeff, I think the worst thing we could, any of us could do right now would be, uh, you know, address this thing with hyperbole. Uh, an incident occurred. We have to work through the incident. We have a channel to be able to do that, and I think it's going to require some diplomatic and military engagement in the next few hours to restore the deconfliction that we've had in place. And again, the deconfliction that we've had in place is in our mutual interest because it allows us to address what at least pro-regime forces have indicated is our common enemy, ISIS. And have you been in touch with your counterpart in Russia? I have not as of yet. I, this morning. Mm -hmm. uh, I have met with my, counter, my Russian counterpart twice this year, and uh, we've communicated maybe another five or six times. Which also leads to... What, what's the situation in Raqqa going to be when it's all said and done? Who's going to control it? Uh, you've got a number of questions about what, what, how that recasts the situation sure. in the region. Uh, first of all, we're, we're supporting uh, the Syrian Democratic Forces in seizing Raqqa. That's a force of about 50,000, of which about 20,000 to 25,000 are Arab, and the balance uh, are Kurdish. Even as we support their efforts to seize Raqqa, there's an ongoing effort led by the State Department to uh, put together a, uh, a governance uh, body uh, so that as soon as uh, Raqqa is seized, there is effective local governance. That governance will, local, uh, will leverage uh, Arab leaders who are from Raqqa, and uh, we'll also work on establishing a security force made up of local personnel so that there is uh, stabilization efforts that will follow the seizure of Raqqa. Let's, let's uh, move around the region a bit. Uh, Iraqi Kurds have announced that they are going to hold an independence referendum on September 25th. What would that mean for U.S. interest in the Middle East? Should the U.S. support it? Look, our, uh, our stated objective at this point is a stable, secure, and sovereign Iraq, and we're supporting the Iraqi security forces in defeating ISIS inside of, of Iraq. And I think the issue of the, uh, the Kurdish referendum is one that will have to be worked out between President Barzani and Prime Minister Abadi and the Iraqi people. So going back to um, the question also becomes in, in, the, er, in the earlier things about Russia and, and, and Syria and whatnot, that whether or not you, you have to relocate or strengthen the security even more at the TAMF training base to be prepared for other regime attacks. Uh, they keep saying it's defensive strikes only against the regime, but when does this cross the line into war with the Syria government? Yeah, I, I think it's important to point out that the incident that took place this weekend followed uh, a combined arms movement of pro-regime forces. Uh, subsequent uh, SU uh, uh, aircraft uh, flew into the area. Uh, we made every effort to warn uh, those individuals not to come any closer. And then the commander uh, made a judgment that there was a threat to the forces that we were supporting and took action. We've, the only actions that we have taken against pro-regime forces in Syria, and there have been two specific incidents, have been in self-defense. And we've communicated that clearly. Uh, back to Afghanistan, do you foresee adding uh, the 4,000 troops? Uh, there's a lot of discussion about whether or not there have been additional forces allocated to Afghanistan. Has that decision been made? How many, force, how many troops are going? When are they going? Uh, and how is that going to un unfold? Sure. Let me, let me see if I can probably answer that question and a, and a few others that haven't been asked about Afghanistan right up front. First of all, no decision has been made. Uh, with regard to the deployment of additional forces in Afghanistan. 
it, one decision that was made by the president was to delegate that decision to Secretary Mattis in terms of forces that would be on the ground. But also, and this is what's important and probably has been underreported, is that Secretary Mattis's decision about additional forces in Afghanistan will be made in the context of a broader strategy review for South Asia that is ongoing and is expected to report back probably sometime in the, in the middle of July. So when Secretary Mattis makes a decision about force levels, which he will clearly communicate with the President, the Secretary of State, in fact, the guidance, the, the direction that he's received is to do that in conjunction with the Secretary of State. Uh, when Secretary Mattis makes that decision about force levels, you know, you can expect that he'll communicate that in a broader context, again, specifically the context of that strategy review. So, you know, it won't be just about Afghanistan. Uh, there are a number of interdependent variables that bear on the problem inside of Afghanistan across the region, and, uh, and we'll be prepared to talk about those as well when we talk about force management levels. The reason why this number 4,000 has been raised is there is a request by the commander uh, to thicken the advise assist effort uh, in Afghanistan. In other words, he's identified areas where he believes additional forces could make uh, the advisor effort in Afghanistan more effective. There is also an outstanding requirement for forces that the commander asked for from NATO uh, last year. And so that's what you've also heard him talk about publicly. And we're short about 3,000 from the stated NATO requirement for forces in Afghanistan. So that, that's where the numbers come from. But again, what I'd emphasize is that any decision on numbers is going to be, is going to be done in that broader context. And speaking of strategy, uh, Senator McCain came out swinging this morning. You have to give him credit. He's doing to both to both Democratic and Republican presidents uh, and Congress and controlled Congresses about whether or not there's an, a strategy for Afghanistan. And he's asking, where is it? What's, what, when's it going to be delivered? What's going to, you know, where's it going to be? Where's it headed? Uh, what's your take on that? Sure. Well, Secretary Mattis and I had the opportunity to appear before uh, Chairman McCain and the Senate Armed Services Committee last Tuesday. And, and uh, when he raised that question, Secretary Mattis said uh, that, number one, we, we agree that Afghanistan is not where we want it to be. And uh, we have spent the last couple of months discussing where it might go in the future. And, uh, and he, as I will today, uh, indicated to, to Chairman McCain that sometime in the middle of July would have that strategic review complete. Uh, we certainly will consult with Chairman McCain and the uh, other members of the Congress as, uh, as, as the coming weeks uh, go on. And then when the, when the Secretary makes a decision about resourcing for the military dimension, realizing that there's broader issues that have to be addressed in the diplomatic and, and economic areas. Which, which raises the question of the authorization of use of military force again. Um, how much lobbying, if there, if if if, I, if you will, is is happening between you and the Congress, or just are you? How's the dialogue unfolding in terms of eventual, actual passage of an authorization for sure, the use of military sure. force, and how is that going to be applied? Yeah, Jeff. I, I mean, I, I I haven't lobbied, but I've been asked uh, several times. Uh, in testimony what my thoughts were on the authorization of use of military force. And for those who don't know, uh, we're relying now on the 2001 authorization of use of military force that was after 9-11. It was modified in 2002. What I have said is that we have all of the legal authority that we need right now to prosecute al-Qaeda, ISIS, other affiliated groups. But my recommendation to the Congress was that they pass an authorization to use of military force. And I thought one of the more important things is that our men and women that are in harm's way would see a clear and unmistakable support from the American people through their Congress. That, that's what I believe uh, right now would be, would be very positive if, if Congress would pass an authorization to mil use of military force. And again, I haven't lobbied for that effort. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm precluded in law from lobbying. But when I'm asked uh, in testimony, as I have been now several times, I'm certainly able to answer that question. And, and what I have focused on is the message that would be sending to those people who are actually making a sacrifice, that what, what message would be sent if Congress would authorize use of military force. So what do you it would say, reinforce, yeah. I think, the message. So what, uh, uh, speaking of, what do you say to an American voter who's, try, who's deciding whether or not they're going to voice an opinion to their member of Congress uh, about, who might be skeptical that thousands of more U.S. troops could be deployed and, uh, and a slightly tweaked strategy might break the stalemate in Afghanistan or other parts of the region, uh, and that there are billions of dollars that have been spent and, and everything that's been done, is there a sort of a fatigue that's out there? How are you going to convince 
the American people that this is going to be a necessary thing if if you decide to deploy tr uh, thousands of troops to the region for Afghanistan and if you have to escalate your involvement in, in Syria. Yeah, I think it's important that the conversation about Afghanistan take place in the context of our vital national interests in South Asia and South Asia as a whole. And there are two, very simply, uh, you know, that I would talk about in public. Uh, one is uh, the remaining threat from terrorist organizations in South Asia who have expressed a desire to have another 9-11 in the United States and conduct attacks. There's about 17 different groups of the 20 that we've globally identified as terrorist organizations. 17 of them operate in the South Asia area and continue to put pressure on those groups, I, I believe, is critical and vital to our national interests. And I would also argue that the pressure that those groups have been under for the last 15 years has been what has prevented another 9-11. The other uh, interest that we have in the region is preventing uh, a regional conflict in uh, in South Asia. So, again, when the strategy comes in, it's less about what's happened over the past 16 years than it is about what are our national interests today in South Asia, what is the context within which we are pursuing our national interests in South Asia, and what's the diplomatic, economic, and military campaign plan that's necessary for us to protect and advance our national interests in South Asia. I, I, I don't believe it's useful to have a conversation about where we've been, how much money we've spent, or how long uh, we have been in Afghanistan. What's most important is articulating to the American people uh, their interest in that region. Why does it matter here in the United States? We owe them that. We should be able to articulate that when we roll out the strategy. And what is it that we're doing? Again, not just militarily, but diplomatically and economically to advance our interests. And that's the conversation we'll be prepared to have. So what's the end game in, in, in Afghanistan, in Syria? And what's your prediction for new cost in, in, in U.S. lives if, if, if that were to happen. Yeah, what, what I would say is from a military dimension, you know, to be clear about what is it we're trying to do, we're trying to support our partners on the ground in driving the level of violence down to where local security forces can actually deal with security challenges with a minimal amount of international support. And we're trying to do that from West Africa to Southeast Asia because what we're dealing with is a trans-regional threat. One of the manifestations of that trans-regional threat is in Afghanistan. But again, it extends from, South, from uh, West Africa to Southeast Asia. And in all cases, that's the broad design of our strategy is to support local forces in actually addressing those security challenges. Some need more uh, support than others, but the methodology is consistent across, uh, across that trans-regional threat. So what degree does that involve pressuring Pakistan? Well, I think Pakistan is is a key to uh, to the to Afghanistan and its security, and in uh, in ensuring that uh, Haqqani does not have sanctuary in South Asia, making sure the Taliban don't have sanctuary in South Asia, making sure there's a secure border between Afghanistan and Pakistan is critical, making sure there's effective uh, political and military relationships between Pakistan and Afghanistan. That's one of the interdependent variables that's going to that's going to allow us to be successful. Let's uh, talk about. <clears throat> excuse me. Let's talk about, uh, going back to Syria, can you talk about the role that Iran is playing in Syria? Is it increasing, particularly through Hezbollah? Yeah, I mean, Iran is playing an unhelpful role in Syria and elsewhere in the Middle East. And, uh, and I've, some of you may have heard me describe it this way before. I think their major export is malign influence across, across the Middle East. And so, uh, you know, again, Iran, unlike the United States and the coalition, is not focused on ISIS inside of Syria. Uh, Iran is focused on propping up the regime that committed atrocities in the civil war. And from my perspective, addressing the grievances of the civil war in Syria is going to be necessary for us to have peace and stability and no longer have a sanctuary for violent extremism. Staying in the region, are you concerned about any long-term implications of the current Gulf crisis on regional security? And has the crisis affected U.S. military operations in the region? I think you said something last week on, on Capitol Hill that your operations are relatively unaffected, but with Turkey sending troops in and the Army, the U.S. Army put, bringing tr uh, troops around in, in around Qatar, uh, how does that, what's, what's happening in terms of operations with CENTCOM right there in the middle of the country that's at the center sure. of the Sure. I mean, and I think most people know, but the reason why we watch Qatar, among the many reasons we watch Qatar so closely, is that's where our combined air operations center is located. That's where the preponderance of aircraft that support our current campaign uh, against ISIS is located. 
and, uh, and so it's pretty significant. That's also the location of the forward command post for the United States Central Command. Uh, what I would tell you is, uh, you know, has there been friction associated with what's ongoing, the political challenges between the GCC and Qatar? Absolutely. But, but m what I said last week remains true in that we have continued to be able to operate even through uh, that friction. And what are you playing any sort of diplomatic role in trying to resolve uh, the issues working in, in concert with Secretary Tillerson and, and so forth. Yeah, we we obviously work the the military to military lane, and we're continuing to do that in support of Secretary Tillerson. But I think Jeff, you you answered the question well. This is this is primarily Secretary Tillerson's uh, lane right now to resolve this uh, issue between the GCC and Qatar and come up with it with a uh, a uh, negotiated solution to the challenge that uh, that addresses the issue. Uh, with Al Qaeda, uh, ISIL, and their offshoots popping up all over the world, with a World War II-style strategy of, of defeating or defeating the, this enemy with our allies in various parts of the world, and I can't quite read this. Okay, I'll, I'll speculate as to what that individual means. Uh, <laughs> first of all, I, you know we don't have. Let me, let me. It's probably important. Let me explain our strategy for dealing with trans-regional violent extremism, again, of which ISIS is one manifestation. First of all, what connects the groups from West Africa to Southeast Asia? Really three things. The flow of foreign fighters, the flow of resources, and the narrative, the message that they disseminate. So strategically, the idea is to be able to cut, and I describe those three things as connective tissue between the groups. So strategically, what we're trying to do is cut that connective tissue. How are we doing that? by establishing a broad coalition with a good exchange of information and intelligence so that we can get after the flow of money, the flow of foreign fighters, and deal with the narrative. Uh, we have now 60 members in a coalition just in Iraq and Syria. I met a few months ago with about 45 of my counterparts from around the world to improve our information and intelligence sharing. We have an interagency intelligence and information sharing uh, location in the Middle East where right now we have about 20 countries that are represented both militarily and their intelligence organizations and their interagency. When I say interagency in the United States, would be organizations like Homeland Security. And the idea is like-minded nations are sharing the intelligence and information that will allow not just for effective military operations, which is one dimension of the problem, but also an effective legal framework in countries where foreign fighters either came from or will return to, and also an effective way of sharing information so we can anticipate the flow of foreign fighters and resources. So with regard to the combat operations, those combat operations then are designed to enable local forces to deal with specific regional challenges. So there's a number of regional efforts, but there's a strategic framework that connects those regional efforts, and that strategic framework is getting after those three elements that actually connect these organizations. In the long-term end state of the strategy is drive the level of violence down in each of the countries where it exists, in each of the regions where it exists, drive the level of violence down, and increase the capacity of local forces such that local forces can deal with that challenge. That's where we're going. That's very much unlike a World War II strategy. And in very isolated cases, our U.S. or coalition forces do in the fighting. The majority of fighting, and you can look at the majority of, of casualties, are being experienced by local forces that are fighting for their own countries. And, uh, and that's the strategy. So I'd be happy to have a reattack if somebody wants to come back and ask another question about that strategy, because I think understanding that is, is, is very important. And by the way, my assessment, my assumption probably more properly is that we're going to be dealing with violent extremism for a long period of time. Some people have described it as a generational problem. Whatever it is, it's, a, it's going to be a long period of time. And so one critical element of our strategy is that it must be politically sustainable, it must be fiscally sustainable, and it must be militarily sustainable. And the one thing I want the American people to know is that we're conducting we're conducting a campaign against violent extremism in the context of all of the challenges that face our country right now to include North Korea, China, Iran, and, uh, and Russia. And so uh, when I talk about sustainability, it's sustainability in the context of making sure that we can address. The United States is a nation that thinks and acts globally. We don't have the luxury of dealing with one thing at a time. We're dealing with all of those simultaneously. And to deal with all of those simultaneously, again, you need to have a strategy that's sustainable. And in the case of violent extremism, fully leverages the capabilities of local partners on the ground who, again, are doing most of the fighting and most of the sacrifice is from local forces. North, speaking of the list you just uh, added, North Korea. What is uh, North Korea has been increasingly um, 
active, shall we say, in its missile tests. Uh, how, is, how, 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 are, how are the U.S. forces positioning themselves to deal with this particular threat, if you're seeing it as a threat? Uh, and how are you trying to de-escalate uh, sure. what, is, uh, what is an increasing uh, tension in, in the region? And specifically, how is the new South Korean president helping uh, in, in this regard? Sure. First of all, uh, to the question, do I view it as a threat? I do. Uh, it's clear to me that Kim Jong-un, uh, the regime, is, is, is on a path of uh, attempting to develop an intercontinental ballistic missile and matching that with a nuclear warhead that can reach the United States. We should be concerned about that, and we are. The primary means of dealing with that is diplomatic and economic pressure, a campaign led by Secretary Tillerson. The military dimension uh, on a day-to-day -day basis is in support of Secretary Tillerson, and as a result, we have a very open dialogue, a very aggressive dialogue with the State Department to make sure that everything that we're doing, everything that we're doing in terms of our military posture is supportive of Secretary Tillerson's primarily economic and diplomatic campaign. And, and many of you have watched closely what's happened in the UN, which has been two, I, I think, unprecedented uh, re sanctions regimes that have been passed this year, and, uh, and that's the primary way that Secretary Tillerson hopes to do that. In the meantime, we have a responsibility, we the Department of Defense, number one, to deter uh, any provocation by Kim Jong-un in the meantime, and to provide the President with a list of options uh, in the event that hostilities occur, and, uh, and that's exactly what we're doing. So again, what I would emphasize is the military dimension today is in support of the diplomatic and economic effort led by the State Department. And at the same time, uh, we have an effective posture in the region to deter KJU and also to respond in the event, in the event that deterrence fails. Uh, speaking of North Korea and China, it seems that the president has been trying to utilize uh, a newfound relationship with his counterpart in China to try to resolve uh, tensions in, in North Korea. How is that impacting what sure. you just said uh, and, and, and is there anything that you're doing in the region that might have an adverse effect? For example, what you're doing with the South China Seas. Right. So uh, the president met with the president of China at Mar-a-Lago, uh, I think it was the end of April. They, were, they discussed two issues. Uh, one of them was this issue of North Korea and, uh, and the commitment to denuclearize the peninsula. Secretary Tillerson has said that you know, a key element of any success we would have in denuclearizing the peninsula would be the cooperation of China. So it's a bit early uh, probably to judge uh, how far we've come in the past four or five weeks, that, but that's a critical piece. In the meantime, Jeff, to talk about other things that we are doing that might be kind of productive to gaining China's uh, support up in North Korea, uh, we view that issue as separate from other issues in the region that we're dealing with, and that we maintain open uh, lines of communication with our Chinese counterparts. And to that point, uh, we will this week have a, uh, a meeting at the Secretary of State, Secretary of Defense level with their counterparts. I'll join that and then follow up uh, with a day with my counterpart uh, in the Pentagon. We will discuss a wide range of issues to include the issue that we just spoke about at length, uh, the North Korea issue. Sorry, sorry to jump back uh, to Syria. Our good colleague, John Donnelly from CQ Roll Call. What's the legal justification for targeting Syria government forces? Yeah, we, we're, we are there and have legal justification under the authorization to use of military force. We are prosecuting a campaign against ISIS and, uh, and al-Qaeda in Syria. Cyber attacks. Uh, cyber attacks threaten the national infrastructure and our complex weapons and defense systems. How is the military doing in, in recruiting the talent needed to defend and defeat cyber attacks? Yeah, wh whoever asked that question, I think it's a great question and, uh, and something I don't take for granted. One thing I, I would have said if I, if, I, uh, if I did filibuster up front and, and talked about our people, I, I would tell you that we have effectively recruited and retained an all-volunteer force even after 16 years at war. But there are certain skill sets, and cyber is one of them, where we have a growth industry inside the department, and there's a lot of competition in industry for the same people that we're trying to incentivize to join uh, the U.S. military or serve as a, as a civilian. So we're not taking that for granted. We are, as you, as you know, looking across the department for different ways to modernize our personnel system uh, to do just that, to recruit and retain high-quality people to include cyber. We have grown uh, the cyber force. We had a, 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 a plan for 133 cyber mission teams. We outlined that plan about three years ago. 
Uh, Seventy percent of those teams now have reached full operational capability. All the rest are, uh, are reached initial operational capability. That means they're out there doing what they get paid to do every day. Uh, so we have met the current requirement. But as we, as we move, look forward, I, I imagine that our requirements will grow. Uh, we've identified a requirement to grow our cyber capability. That means we'll need more high-quality, motivated people to come in that are committed to the mission, and, uh, and we've got to find a way to incentivize that. And that doesn't necessarily mean that the way we've done business in the past is the way we're going to be able to do business in the future. And another one from the audience. How do you create a rational military strategy with an impulsive president? Okay, I, I don't think someone really expects me to answer a question like that, uh, <laughs> and, I, and I mean that sincerely. I mean, the one thing that I'm very proud of, and I hope as Americans, I mean, I, I am proud of freedom of the press, and I'm proud of what you do every day, and I'm not just saying that. But I also... Um, Thank you, sir. No, I, I mean that, and, I, that. and I've said that in private to the, to the folks I work with closely in the Pentagon. But I hope you're equally proud that the United States military remained apolitical during a very difficult political season. And, uh, and I'm certainly proud of our men and women in uniform, and I can't think of a single case where an active duty member has, uh, has violated what, in effect, is our, eth is our ethos. Uh, and I'm equally sensitive to making sure that that record maintains in the future. And, uh, and as, as the senior U.S. military uh, officer in the country, I think you know, our, our men and women look to me as an example, and so I would never answer a question like that. And so thanks. <laughs> Just a reminder of those who may be watching, not everybody in the room is a journalist, uh, so we ask for a bit of a decorum from our colleagues uh, and hold your applause. Those who are applauding may be guests or, uh, the, or members of the public. Uh, United States is providing thousands of weapons and heavy weapons to Kurdish groups which have been regarded as terrorist organization by Turkey. How do you guarantee that these weapons will not be turned against your 65-year-old NATO ally after fighting against ISIL? All of our, first of all, uh, we are very focused on maintaining the relationship that we have, as you pointed out, Jeff, our NATO ally in Turkey. And to that point, uh, I've made nine trips to Turkey in the past 12 months. I've met with my Turkish counterpart probably no less than 15 times uh, in the last year to try to make sure we maintain a very effective relationship with a NATO ally. Uh, we've also told them that at the end of the day, uh, a key element of our campaign is making sure we accomplish the mission with our relationship with Turkey, uh, our NATO ally, intact. So we have sat down with the Turks. We have a very tight framework uh, to allay their concerns. Uh, we have transparency in reporting. We're providing them routine reports of exactly what we're doing. We're providing them transparency on the type of weapons that we have, and we have put in mechanisms in place to make sure that the weapons that we're providing to the Syrian Democratic Forces are intended for Raqqa and Raqqa only and don't find their way back inside of Turkey. So whoever asked that question, it, it's, a, it's a very important question. It's a strategic question because it affects a relationship with an important ally. And, but we're mindful of that. And, uh, and, and to that point, Secretary Mattis Next week, we'll once again meet with, uh, with his Turkish counterpart in Europe and, and go through this. And uh, last Thursday, he wrote a very detailed letter to his Turkish counterpart, providing a routine update. And again, both uh, I speak routinely to General Hulusi Arkar, who's become a good friend. He's the Turkish chief of defense. And General Mike Scaparotti, our European command commander, speaks to General Arkar probably at least once a week. And we have a very, very robust presence of both the United States Central Command and the United States European Command in Ankara in a joint operations center with our Turkish counterparts, again, to mitigate the concerns that you outlined, Jeff. Thank you. Uh, jumping around a bit, Senate passed a, a broad sanctions package last week against uh, Iran and Russia. Uh, how is, are the details of that, uh, broad strokes, of, uh, impacting mili U.S. military strategy in, that, in those countries? Or, yeah. or in that re in the region, both towards Russia and, and towards Iran. Yeah, sorry for a relatively short answer on that, but that, but there's been no impact on on, uh, on the military dimension of our relationship with either country at this point. Okay. Uh, budget questions, and there's a lot of them. Uh, are you comfortable after after 17 hours of testimony? Said, yeah, last week, so you were on the hill quite I'm a bit really, last week. Uh, really looking forward to these. <laughs> Go ahead, Jeff. Are you comfortable with how? Uh, 
how the U.S. is defending defense dollars to address emerging military capabilities of near competitor states? Yeah, the, the short answer is no, and let me walk back. I think it's fair to say at the turn of the century, 2000, uh, we had a decisive competitive advantage in our ability to project power when and where necessary to advance our interests and meet our alliance commitments. We could do that. And, and, and just for those who don't track uh, what we do routinely, um, I believe there are two sources of strength in our country. At the strategic level, it's the network of allies and partners that we have built up since World War II. And at the operational level, it's been our historic ability to project power from the United States, again, to advance our interests and meet our alliance commitments. Our peer competitors have studied the United States since Desert Storm. They studied the development of precision munitions. They studied our ability to project power. And in, in almost every case, you look at China, Russia, Iran in particular, what they have done over the last few years is started to develop what has been called in the, in the, in the trade journals the anti-access area denial uh, capability. And what that simply means is develop a wide range of capabilities that keep the United States from moving into Europe, in the case of Russia, moving into the Pacific, meeting our alliance commitments, or then operating freely within Europe or within, uh, within the Pacific. And so my greatest concern, and the emphasis that I placed on it last week in, 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 uh, in testimony I think highlights that, is that the United States of America has to maintain a competitive advantage in the ability to project power when and where necessary to meet our alliance commitments or uh, advance our interests. And as a result of anti-ship cruise missiles, anti-ship ballistic missiles, electronic warfare capability, anti-space capability, uh, a wide other range of, of maritime offensive undersea capabilities, you know, there are areas of concern. And so one of the things that we're doing at a very classified level is communicating with Congress to talk about the areas of competitive advantage, and we've identified a number of those, and we can talk with specificity about where are we today relative to where we need to be in maintaining a competitive advantage, where will we be in five years in our ability to maintain a competitive advantage, and what specific capabilities must be fielded to ensure that the chairman in 2022 or 2023 could be as confident of our ability to project power then as I am, as I am today. So, uh, again, as a result of uh, unstable budgets and operational tempo, well, we have been focused on violent extremism. Well, we have delayed modernization programs from the nuclear enterprise to our shipbuilding program. Our potential adversaries haven't had to suffer through that same experience, and what they have been on is a very consistent pattern of capability development designed specifically, again, to limit our ability to project power. And as Americans, we should be concerned about that because our ability to project power is a critical element of conventional deterrence. And I believe right now that our competitive advantage conventionally has, in fact, uh, mitigated the risk of conflict. And a loss of that competitive advantage conventionally would be, it would be a risk. And obviously, uh, the loss of, our, of, uh, of a safe, effective, and reliable nuclear deterrent is also a concern. And so that's, that really is the, the primary thrust of our, uh, of our budget recommendations. Between the Budget Control Act, the uh, continuing resolutions, you were countless hours of testimony. Has, has Congress and the White House essentially you know, failed the military? With, with, by, by not coming to an agreement and getting the, the military the stability it needs in its funding to increase uh, its, its, its personnel, strengthen its modernization, and all those other things you just mapped out. As I, I was reading through your test, uh, scores of hours of testimony, and House, Senate, committee by committee by committee, the same things kept coming up over and over and over again that you were being effectively shortchanged. Yeah, the, the one thing that, that I said in testimony and I routinely say is I, I fundamentally don't believe we, we should be sending our young men and women into a fair fight. We shouldn't be doing that as, as Americans. We're going to send them someplace. We ought to send them with the wherewithal to accomplish the mission with the minimal loss of life or equipment. That's, I think, a responsibility. Uh, we're not going to be able to do that with the Budget Control Act. We're not going to be able to do that with more continued resolutions. We are where we are right now. It began back in 2012, and with the exception of one assignment, I've been intimately involved in where we've been since 2012 with regard to the budget. And as a result of continued resolutions every year, as a result of the Budget Control Act, we haven't been able to properly prioritize and allocate the resources the American people give to us for the nation's defense. And if we don't lift the budget caps, if we don't repeal the Budget Control Act, 
and we don't get back to regular order, that is passing a budget every year, we will not get out of the trough that we have uh, found ourselves in as a result of seven or eight or nine years. And it's going to take us some time to get out of that trough. But the only way we'll get out of that trough is to have regular order in a budget process. We cannot sustain the path we're on right now and maintain that competitive advantage. Let's talk. I want speaking to of regular a, order. Uh, uh, speaking of regular order. Um, <laughs> You talk, you, you, one of, there are several things you can pluck out of that. I mean, you've got decades-old ICBMs. You've got all this you know, military vehicles that are, that are, that are not uh, equivalent to their, to their peer counterparts and other in competitor nations. Uh, where do you start? I mean, there's, there seems to be a long, long laundry list of what you have to fix in order to be competitive. Yeah, first of all, it starts with the nuclear enterprise, and we've made that, uh, that we believe that's the department's number one res responsibility is to deter nuclear war. And it would, be, it would be nice if we didn't have to invest in a nuclear enterprise. It would be nice if nuclear weapons weren't a part of our national defense strategy. But the truth of the matter is the enemy gets a vote, and actually Russia has increased the role of nuclear weapons in their defense strategy, and maintaining an effective deterrence is important. So that's, that's job one. I spoke about uh, our ability to project power, Jeff, and, and again, what we have done is we've taken a look at each of the four state actors and the one non-state actor. So I don't, I don't use this four plus one as what we call it inside the building as a predictive model, but here's an important assumption that you can test. Uh, what I believe is if we build a U.S. military with the right inventory of capabilities and the right capacities, that is the right size, so the right capabilities and the right size force, that can deal with Russia, China, Iran, North Korea, or violent extremism, or some combination thereof, that will have the right force in the future to maintain a competitive advantage and deal with what we most certainly will deal with is the unexpected. I mean, as I tell people, if there's anything I've learned in 40 years of, 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 uh, of active duty, it's, it's uh, to be humble about our ability to pre predict the future. But again, just like any industry, you have to benchmark yourself against something. So what we have done is benchmarked ourselves against those four plus one, in the way we will inform our priorities that we provide to Congress is by looking at where we are today relative to where we'll be five years from now in terms of our competitive advantage, and that will be where the priorities outside the nuclear enterprise are, uh, are, uh, are established. And, of course, there's other things about training the force and so forth, but I'm speaking about it from a joint inventory perspective. Uh, let's go global again. Uh, you mentioned briefly NATO. Uh, when the president was on his overseas trip, he had some pretty tough words for NATO. Uh, how, did, how did those words have an effect on your dealings with your counterparts and with the, other, with the allies that we have dealt with for so, so long? Uh, th this is, uh, in some may find this hard to believe, but first of all, I was in NATO, I think, probably 10 days ago. I'm there at least every quarter, uh, met with all now 29 uh, members of NATO. Uh, witness uh, this afternoon, I think about 4 o'clock, I'll meet with my Montenegrin counterparts. So I'm either speaking to or meeting with uh, one of my NATO counterparts every week. There's certainly a week doesn't go by where I'm not meeting with one or more of them. So I have a pretty good sense, I think, for uh, where we are in our relationship. And I would tell you, the, mil the military to military relationship to include uh, our combined operations in uh, Afghanistan, to include our combined operations in Syria and Iraq, to include the partnership we have with the French in West Africa, to include the partnership we have with the French in the United Kingdom and the United States in East Africa, uh, has not suffered a bit. And, uh, and frankly, I think given the, the common challenges we have right now, uh, I'd, I'd find someone hard-pressed historically to go back and find a time when more than 30 nations have stayed together in the fight for over a decade like we have in Afghanistan, or we've been able to put together a coalition of 60 countries, of which 22 are actually contributing effective military capabilities in Iraq and Syria. So what I would ask you to do when you think about what impact or where we are with regard to our allies is look at what we're doing, not what we're saying. And what we're doing uh, across the world is pretty, is, uh, I, I believe, from a coalition and alliance perspective, pretty effective. Chairman, uh, when serving as Commandant of the Marine Corps, you were the only service chief to oppose the integration of women into ground combat arms jobs and units and chose not to appear at the Secretary of Defense's press conference to announce the change. Now that you're chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, what's your current position on the issue? Are you now in favor of opening all military jobs and units to qualify women? If not, why not? Yeah, I, I hope people will appreciate that when you provide military advice, 
uh, you do so in good faith. And, uh, and at the end of the day, when you're in uniform and you're inside the Department of Defense, you provide military advice, and then our civilian leadership, as it should be, makes a decision. So the day Secretary Carter made a decision, I had but one task, which was to, with full commitment, implement the decision that Secretary Carter made and to make sure that the command climate that was set from our most senior leaders all the way down to the squad leaders was an effective command climate to implement that decision. I also want to tell you that when I made the recommendation to Secretary Carter, uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't a, I don't recommend uh, women be integrated. Uh, first of all, even as a commandant in the Marine Corps, I opened up all, all but 2% of the occupational fields in the Marine Corps is my recommendation. And with those fields that I did not recommend, I outlined the specific conditions that I thought would be, should be set before we move forward with full integration. So it was a question of, Mr. Secretary, we've done some very careful analytic work. We've done some experimentation. Here's the issues that should be considered when we go to full, full integration. And my recommendation is we address these issues before we integrate. In a conversation, he said, okay, that's fine. I understand your perspective. I believe that we can address the issue. He said, I accept the issues that you've raised. And by the way, if you look at the memo that Secretary Carter signed out to implement the decision, every single issue that is in the letter that I sent to him is reflected in Secretary Carter's implementation memo. And he said, okay, General, I got it, but here's what I believe. I believe the issues that you've raised can be addressed in implementation, and this, this process doesn't have to be sequential. I said, I got it, yes, sir, and we've been off. And so I haven't thought about anything other than executing the Secretary's decision since that day, and that's the way it ought to be. Along those lines, uh, Mr. Chairman, there are thousands of transgender service members who are honorably serving in the military today. Last, last year, then-Secretary Carter created the new policy allowing transgender individuals to openly serve and allow new transgender recruits to join. Uh, why is the Pentagon considering changing this policy? Okay, first of all, let's be clear. Uh, there's, we, the trans, transgender personnel are serving right now, and there's no uh, review ongoing that would affect the ability of those currently serving to continue serving, provided they can meet the physical and mental qualifications of service, be worldwide deployable in the same standards that every other soldier, sailor, airman, and marine meets. The issue now is the challenges of assessing individuals and the criteria for assessing. And so that's, there have been some issues raised with regard to challenges of assessing transgender individuals, and that's, that's what the Secretary is, uh, is reviewing. So this is not a reversal of the policy that was implemented before. This is the next phase of implementation was accessions, and there have been some issues identified with accessions that you know, the service chiefs, some of the service chiefs believe need to be resolved before we move forward. And so that's where we are right now. The Joint Strike Fighter is entering service, but with many cost overruns and delays. Will it, uh, will it continue as a program, or is it too expensive to maintain? Well, that's a pretty loaded question, and someone has an agenda in the way that they phrase that question. But uh, first of all, the F-35 is operationally deployed today, so it will remain as a program. And, uh, and we went, and the initial operating capability in the Marine Corps was made before I changed jobs in July of 2015. I had sufficient confidence in the F-35 to declare it initially operational capable and declare that first squadron capable of worldwide deployment, and it subsequently has deployed. We also, you will see in the budget, have a significant buy of F-35s uh, in, the, in the budget this year and would expect that to continue in the future. Uh, the, the challenges associated with the F-35, whether they be engineering or cost overruns, you know, I would argue, and not anomalous to many, many other programs that, ha that, we, have, that we have had inside the Department of Defense. And, and, uh, and frankly, the cost overruns uh, a bit of that is history because uh, over the past 18 to 24 months, I think most people would argue, and Congress certainly, I think, supports this perspective, that uh, the program manager has done a great job of getting a lot of those cost overruns back in check and, and the cost of the aircraft and the operation and sustainment cost also in check. So uh, the short answer is the F-35 is a critical program. Uh, I believe it's not a better F-18 or a better bomb truck fourth generation, but it's a transformational capability. Uh, both its, its ability to deliver ordnance as well as its ability to serve literally as a server in the sky is going to transform the way we fight. And I think we fully haven't appreciated all the things it's going to do for cha to change our warfighting concepts. 
With the proliferation of quote, lo, quote unquote, lone wolf act, actors of terror, what steps uh, are being taken by the U.S. military to prevent uh, Osama bin Laden's grown son from perpetuating terror strictly in the U.S.? Okay, those seem to me to be two separate issues, right? Yes. Uh, lone wolf uh, in the United States and, and then uh, oh, Osama, oh, bin Osama bin Laden's son. Yeah. Osama bin Laden's son. Uh, earlier, I spoke about this, intelli this network for intelligence and information sharing. So to the latter question, uh, you know, making sure that we have a common intelligence picture, common operational picture, that is that we have a common understanding with all the nations that are affected by extreme is a critical part to keep those individuals from being able to plan and conduct external operations, which is job number one for us in the counterterrorism uh, fight is to prevent attacks on the United States uh, or on our allies and partners. Uh, with regard to lone wolf uh, attacks, uh, we, uh, we are in support of, uh, of local and uh, federal law enforcement officials. And so if you talk about lone wolf U.S. citizens inspired by propaganda, the military dimension of that problem is battlefield success that undermines the credibility of the narrative, even as local law enforcement and so forth deal with individual U.S. citizens who may be inspired to commit acts of violence. We're running short on time, so uh, I'm going to one more substance question, and then I'm going to give you our traditional mug. Uh, what can be done to stem the flow of refugees in the Mediterranean Sea and human suffering? Should refugee centers be built in North Africa and other areas to provide safe havens for those fleeing violence and famine, and what role should NGO or groups like the Vatican play? Yeah, uh, let me let me answer that question at least in my lane, and and I would argue, a lot of times when we look at violent extremism, we focus on the risk of attacks, and we should. Uh, the, the the tragic loss of life associated with violent extremism is a big issue, but if you think about it, uh, probably uh, the most significant uh, effect of violent extremism has been the flow of refugees. It, certainly the impact it's had in Europe uh, from a political perspective and then just the sheer human suffering that's taken place as a result of 10 million people just in the case of Syria that have been dislocated or have become refugees. About half have become refugees, half have been dislocated inside of Syria. So it's a tragic outcome of violent extremism. I think the military uh, dimension of that particular problem is working with local partners to create the conditions where people can be safe at home and don't have the need to go and become refugees. And obviously, we can also support in providing some immediate support in the form of water supplies and food and making sure that the conditions are conducive to non-governmental organizations or, uh, in the case of USAID or, or government organizations, to be able to provide that kind of support. But we work very closely with, uh, with USAID. Uh, particularly in stabilization of places like Mosul and Raqqa. And I can tell you, uh, when we sit down and develop a campaign plan for Raqqa and Mosul, uh, sitting at the table is USAID to make sure that we can go into stabilization immediately after hostilities cease and set conditions as quickly as possible to relieve some of the human suffering. Before I uh, ask the last question, I'm going to pre present our traditional National Press Club mug. And uh, the, Mr. Chairman, your, your picture will go on, on the wall outside with the rest of the historic speakers that have been coming here since we started the speakers program in 1920. Uh, last question goes back to Sue. Wait a minute. Last thought... question. <laughs> Let, I said one before. There's oh, one right, last right, one. Right, right. Can you expand upon your plans after ISIL is defeated? That's an optimistic question. You say that the uh, does, it, does it become a safe zone? Are you prepared to protect it from aerial attack? And is there a no-fly zone, and are you then planning to expand that zone? Okay. I think it's probably, if you don't mind, I'm going to answer a different question. I mean, we'll, we'll, we'll certainly – no, I mean, I'll answer the Raqqa piece, but there's a broader question, which is what about after ISIS? So after ISIS and Raqqa, I mentioned earlier, we're working now with the State Department to make sure there's effective governance there, make sure there's local forces that are recruited to provide security inside of Raqqa, and, and that's our plan for Raqqa. But – what I would tell you is that uh, violent extremism is not over with ISIS. And that's why, in fact, one of the reasons why I'm running now uh, at, at 1330 is we, we have, 130, we have uh, all of our combatant commanders and service chiefs together here in about 30 minutes uh, for a quarterly review of where we are in dealing with violent extremism and very much looking towards long-term framework for our operations. Again, 
I talked earlier about politically, fiscally, and militarily sustainable with an assumption that this is a long-term fight and making sure that we constantly review our organizational construct, making sure we constantly review our intelligence sharing uh, relationships, making sure we constantly review the success of our partners on the ground and what additional support they need is all part of what we're trying to do. But, but this, is, uh, this is a long-term fight, and so Raqqa is tactical. Mosul is tactical. I believe it will have strategic effects on the overall messaging because it certainly undermines the credibility that there's a physical caliphate that exists in the Middle East when they lose Raqqa and Mosul. But we ought not to confuse success in Raqqa and Mosul as something that means it's the end of the fight. Uh, I think we should all be braced for a long fight, and, uh, and that's why we're so, we, we so emphasize making sure that we have the broadest network possible of partners uh, to help deal with this challenge, because it's not about just the United States. It's about the 120-plus countries from which foreign fighters have come just to Iraq and Syria. And, uh, and, and, and to the degree that we can get all 120 of those countries or as many of them as possible to cooperate in intelligence sharing, information sharing, and effective action, limit the freedom of movement of foreign fighters, uh, limit their ability to share resources and erode the effectiveness of their narrative that will be successful. But, but again, we're prepared for a long-term fight and a constant review of, uh, of how we're addressing it. If there's one thing I would leave you with, don't ever think that, uh, that those of us in uniform are complacent about any of the issues that we've spoken about today. In fact, I tell people that, you know, when I was a second lieutenant, my level of experience uh, arguably was way down here, and, uh, but I would, my level of confidence that I had all the answers was way up here. <laughs> and uh, and as, I, as I speak to you today, my level of experience is arguably way up here, and my level of confidence on the issues that we're dealing with that I, that I have all the answers is way down here. These are extraordinarily complex, if not wicked, problems we're dealing with. And uh, beware of those with too much confidence that they have all the answers. Thank you. Thank you. For I ask as you uh, keep your stay in your seats as, as the chairman leaves the hall. Uh, for more information on our programs, you can log into www.press.org. We are adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.